Hi everybody, welcome to another edition of the Zero the Educate podcast. Today we have with us Professor Alex Thomas who teaches at Ajim Brainji University. And the interesting thing about Alex Professor Thomas is that he's come up with a new book called An Introduction to Microeconomics. Now why we're talking about this book is because of the way it differs from the traditional textbooks that we've been reading since we've been studying economics as we grew up. So the first thing that differentiates this book is that this is written by an Indian and the context of the book book is very Indian. The examples that are given in this book are very Indian. So it doesn't seem foreign. And this book touches on a lot of sensitive topics like the role of caste in, let's say, labor mobility, the role of gender in a patriarchal society in India. And this differentiates this book from every other piece of literature that's available out there. So in this podcast, obviously, Professor Thomas talks about this book in general. But he also delves into the specific chapters to give you guys an understanding of the, how he thinks about this book and how this book is structured. And we also touch about topics from outside of the book. Let's say, for example, the modern monetary theory, which has been in vogue since he's written this book. So it came a little after this book. So this is pretty much what we've covered in this podcast. And please tune in to look into the integrities of Mr. Alex Thomas's take on macroeconomics in a very desi and an alternate way. Hi Alex, um, thank you for joining us and I've had the privilege of going through your book which is just an amazing piece and that's why we decided to come and speak to you. So before we begin with this podcast and start talking about your book, could you just tell us a little about yourself, about where you're from, how you went into economics and what you're doing currently? Uh, thanks Abhinav and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, although I've spoken about my book uh, at different universities and uh, colleges, I think this is the first time that I'm talking to a very different audience, uh, I think who are primarily interested in financial markets. Uh, so, and I mean, on the question of financial market, I think it also ties to a little bit about one of the motivations to do economics is when I was uh, a student, I think I was in class 10 or 11. And I, when, when I went through the newspapers, there used to be this towards the end, two, three pages of uh, text where the stock market prices and the you know the names used to be mentioned and I was very curious about you know what these uh, prices are what this page is meant and I remember actually going uh, maybe in the holidays to one of the local uh, places where people went to trade so I did spend some time uh, there this was uh, in a place called Chettikolangara uh, in Kerala uh, which falls within the Alapi district. So there is some connection between, I think, this podcast somewhere and my motivations to do economics. Uh, And since then, uh, I have pursued economics, uh, various degrees. And one of the things that I've always been interested in is how to teach economics, because as a student, I often felt that uh, the teaching of economics could improve, uh, whether it was about the material, whether it was about the pedagogy. There was always things that I thought, um, you know, one, one could improve. On And then um, in this kind of reading uh, and my exposure to various kinds of economics at the University of Hyderabad, I then started pursuing political economy more seriously. And in fact, uh, also related to it, I was also interested in the history of economic ideas. Uh, So for my MPhil and my PhD, I uh, continue to work on history of economic thought and political economy. And in fact, many of these elements of uh, political economy and history of economic thought are uh, present in my uh, book. And maybe I'll just take this opportunity to just show this uh, copy of the book because uh, what the kind of illustration that is there in this book, uh, at least in the cover page of the book, also highlights um, history of economic ideas uh, explicitly. So yes, and uh, so I teach economics uh, at Azim Premji University in Bangalore, uh, and I also do research in the areas of political economy and history of economic thought. Oh yeah, thank thanks for that uh, brief intro. Oh, could you just share that book again because I think there was a blip in between. Yeah, so we'll also drop a link in the description for our readers who are interested in this book. So I have personally read this book, and I really recommend that you go through this book because it's very indianized way of teaching macroeconomics to anyone also before we move on further there's a very simple question that i have could you explain what so history of economic ideas is self-explanatory could you explain what political economy means 
Sure. So in the, I mean, I think maybe one of the basic ways of explaining is that what determines, if we ask the question, what determines the prices of commodities? And if you ask most uh, students who are going through a mainstream economics education and curriculum, the answer will be demand and supply. Uh, and if we dig a little bit further, it will be some element of utility or marginal utility that students uh, respond with. But if we ask the same question to those working in the political economy tradition, the answer is different. People might say that it is labor theory of value, uh, which essentially means that the prices of commodities are determined by the labor that goes directly and indirectly into the production of commodities. So, on, I mean, this is just as a kind of brief uh, illustration to talk about the dif differences between these two schools of thought on in the mainstream school of thought, you have utility or some variant of utility as determining prices. Whereas in political economy tradition, you have one of the traditions in political economy, you have labor as determining the prices of commodities. So even as even with something as basic as what determines the price of commodities, I would say that these two are distinct paradigms uh, which try to explain various kinds of economic phenomena. Uh, in the in our uh, society okay okay thank you for that so i have a very simple question let's say from like an average listener of ours so let's say i'm a layman right and i am only interested in finance or stock markets for example and maybe i want to know a little bit about economics so why should i care about this subject right in the sense that um, like why should i know that how economics is taught in school or colleges today and how your book teaches it differently and what are your motivations behind this book so actually, I mean, uh, interestingly, I was uh, having a discussion about the rate of interest uh, with a close friend of mine in the last couple of days, uh, because the question of what determines the rate of interest is of importance to uh, people who want to understand the stock market uh, slash finance and also historians of economic thought, particularly who are looking at monetary, uh, monetary economics and macroeconomics and certainly for economists in general. And I just want to give a brief maybe overview of the discussion that we had because I think it's sort of, uh, it ties to the question that you're asking and then I'll explain a little bit about what I do in the book. If you take a sort of large history of how interest rates have been understood, going all the way back to somebody like Thomas Aquinas, who was influenced by Christianity, but also by Aristotle, at the time that Aquinas is writing, the argument is that any kind of interest rate is bad or you talk about usury is bad. And the logic that was given was time belongs to God. So therefore, nobody should be able to make a profit of uh, time. Uh, then later, there's been another kind of uh, idea of interest rate, which is to say that it depends on how much you prefer future consumption over present consumption. This in the literature is sometimes called as time preference. So rate of interest is also being understood as a rate of time preference. Now there's another kind of, I mean, and associated with this is sometimes the idea of uh, equilibrating saving and investment. So people talk about saving and investment and rate of interest as equilibrating saving and investment. And today central bankers draw upon this kind of idea, the rate uh, of interest as time preference as also equilibrating saving and investment. And it is in this context that uh, central bankers and economists talk about the natural rate of interest. Now, the idea of natural rate of interest is a mainstream idea. And one of the alternative ideas that has come from the political economy tradition, including economists as famous as Keynes, is the idea that rate of interest is not, now there's nothing natural about the rate of interest. It's not determined in any particular market for saving or investment, but rather it is a convention. It is set by people who are in important positions of power. So in the mainstream kind of idea, the rate of interest is uh, determined by the market, uh, by people, whereas in the, in the alternative political economy tradition, the rate of interest is set by policymakers or people who are in power. And depending on your 
theory of the rate of interest, the kind of policy making that one would do would also differ. Now, having said this, what I wanted to do then was uh, to communicate to people. I mean, a primary um, audience for my book is certainly students who are studying about economics. But also I wanted to talk to people who are generally interested in macroeconomics and the Indian economy. Because, uh, uh, for instance, people who want to choose a particular uh, poli I mean, policy or, you know, you want to vote in elections, how do you distinguish between various kinds of economic ideas? So this, so as, I mean, as a kind of input into this kind of thinking, I wanted to give to the readers the idea that there exist multiple paradigms, multiple schools of thought in economics, whether it's microeconomics or macroeconomics, there always exist multiple schools of thought. And I provide uh, the, my readers with two schools of thought. One is the dominant school of thought and the other is the political economy tradition. So in this manner, the readers of this book are able to get a sense of what is the mainstream telling us, what are the kind of critical questions and limitations of this kind of a school of thought, and what is political economy telling us, and how are we able to use the political economy tradition to make sense of our uh, surroundings. Okay. Uh, so Alex, I'm very glad that you touched upon this topic because my next question also emanates from this. The idea that there is a dominant approach, which in your textbook you call the marginalist approach. And then I also like how you follow a pluralistic approach in the sense that you tell people that economics is not necessarily one stream of thought. It's as much as an art as a science. And there are different streams of thought which could be arriving at either similar conclusions or different conclusion, but they would follow completely different parts and all of them could actually be right and all of them could actually be wrong. Right. So in this light, could you please tell our listeners what is the dominant or the marginalist approach that is being followed today? And could you give some examples of the pluralistic approach that you followed in your book? So maybe first I'll talk a little bit about the teaching of economics itself. Uh, and when I say hmm. teaching, it's not just formal teaching of economics, I think, in universities and colleges and in schools. Uh, but it's also uh, economics education in general, what is there you know, on social media, what we get from books in general. When we talk of mainstream economics, we are really talking about literature uh, in general. One of the things, and especially uh, in India, what we see is that most of the curriculum and most of the textbooks are written by people who are teaching uh, in America, for instance. So one of the most famous textbooks is that by Mankiw, and earlier it was by Samuelson. And two things that they do, one is that in their textbooks, they promote the idea that there is only one school of thought, uh, which is the school of thought that they're working in, and which is what is called the mainstream school of thought or the marginalist school of thought. And I'll explain what that means uh, uh, in a few minutes. And the other kind of issue is that because, and this is not an issue for them because they are teaching American students, so all the institutions, all the examples are American in nature. But when we choose these books for educating our people here, I think that there is an issue because we are not able to relate to many of these kinds of examples and institutions. Although I think it's mm -hmm. important that we know what these institutions are, but I don't think it's primarily, I mean, we need to be able to bring in Indian institutions into a curriculum. And this kind of an approach that believes that there is only one school of thought is what is called monism, generally in the literature. What I sort of espouse in my book and many others have spoken about it is the idea of pluralism, which is to say that even when it comes to the question of what determines the rate of interest, what determines prices, what determines inflation, what determines employment, there are at least two schools of thought in economics. And not just that, in addition, people who work in the alternative traditions continue to publish, continue to do research in these areas, and they have associations, conferences, journals. But when you read textbooks that are mainstream, you don't get a sense that there exists another school of thought. So my attempt really in my book has been to show to the readers that there exist these schools of thought. There's also a lot of literature uh, in the political economy tradition. And by pluralism, 
I mean, although in my book, I don't really go into pluralism in all these aspects. I think that what I do in my book is to talk about pluralism with respect to economic theory. So, as I mentioned before, what determines prices, what determines wages, what determines employment, what determines growth, what determines inflation. Let's say these five different questions. In my book, I show that there are at least two paradigms, two schools of thought, which give different explanations for these questions. And according to me, uh, there are several dissatisfactions, theoretical and conceptual, with the mainstream school of thought. And therefore, my preference has been uh, to adopt the political economy school of thought in trying to make sense of the Indian economy. Okay, uh, so so before we move on, like, uh, like could you just explain in more in like in, in simpler terms, basically what the marginalist approach is, right? Because that's the dominant approach that's been taught in our schools, and what exactly does it mean? Yeah, thanks, Abhinav. Actually, I forgot to do that in my previous <laughs> answer. So, uh, I, let me just go back to a school textbook, um, which is whether it is in ISC syllabus or the CBSC board. One of the things that people do with respect to the definition of economics is that we, uh, we are taught that first Adam Smith gave a definition, then Ricardo gave a definition, then Alfred Marshall, then Lionel Robbins, and then Paul Samuelson. Uh, by the time it comes to Paul Samuelson, Lionel Robbins, and Alfred Marshall, the definition of economics has changed. And the definition of economics is more to do with allocation, unlimited wants, limited resources, and the question of choice. So in the definitions of Marshall, Lionel Robbins and Samuelson, economics has become a science of choice. That's one part. But if you take a look at Smith and Ricardo, economics is understood as a science of income, a science of production, science of how do you distribute what you have produced. So in our school textbooks and even in latest textbooks, we are taught that the definition of Samuelson is an improvement over the definition of Adam Smith. So this kind of a viewpoint suggests that there is only one economics and we are just improving over previous economies. So this kind of a um, viewpoint I challenge in my book by saying that there are two kinds of economics and we have to understand that there are two distinct kinds of economics. Now, what is this approach that is proposed by people like Marshall, Robbins and Samuelson? All of them make use of uh, reasoning at the margin. So reasoning at the margin is not something I think human beings do generally unless we are trained in economics or mainstream economics. But in any case, these economists use terms such as marginal cost, marginal revenue, marginal product, marginal utility. And for instance, what is marginal product? The explanation that is provided is that if you have a production process and we employ one additional worker, what is the addition to the total product? So you have a wor one worker gets added and how much does this one worker add to the total product? So that is how you have marginal product. And this mm -hmm. kind of a term or a concept is used in the context of consumption. Then you have marginal utility. In the context of revenue, you have marginal revenue. In the context of cost, you have marginal cost. So this marginal concept is very widespread when it comes to uh, mainstream economics. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I think that this is just one way of reasoning. Uh, but the way in which it has been set up seems to suggest that this is the most rational way of reasoning and the most efficient way of reasoning. And this is what leads to certain outcomes. Thanks for explaining this. Uh, so I'm glad that you touched upon this topic about multiple definitions of economics existing, right? And every definition coming with its own time, with its own ideologies, with its own reasons. So that brings me to the question that you also talk about in your book, wherein you say that before we move on to what is economics, let's try to understand why economics, right? In, in the sense that what are your motivations behind economics? So what exactly do you mean by that? And how much of an impact will it have on someone's view of economics or understanding of economics. Yeah, so I mean, what I've, uh, in a way, uh, my motivation for writing that is because very often we, um, you know, tend to study economics maybe to understand uh, the social, uh, the social world. Sometimes it is mm -hmm. to understand the financial market. Uh, sometimes it is for policy making. Uh, sometimes maybe you're just interested in the subject. 
but the what sometimes seems to be happening is we break what we teach based on what students are interested in so a management institute might think that it's not important to teach history of economic thought or economic history because it's primarily interested in managerial questions or a university might think that it is not very important to talk about uh, let's say managerial economics or financial economics because it has got more to do with the corporate sector or the financial sector but i think what i show in that i think it's a very small section is that there are a lot of interconnections in the system so what happens in the monetary sector has an impact on the financial market what happens in the financial market has an impact on rural india what happens in rural india has an impact on inflation and therefore on other prices so unless we are able to understand the interconnectedness of many of our phenomena the education that is then sort of parceled out depending on you know what people's interests are and what the central audience is sometimes can be piecemeal so if i'm studying ecological economics i might just look at certain aspects of the economy and not look at others and what i try to do in the macroeconomics book is that try to give a holistic perspective because otherwise i feel today information is extremely fragmented uh, and on social media sometimes we uh, get a new idea and then we work on it but often we are able to uh, not really see the links between various parts of the economy so which is why you know it's not traditional in a macroeconomics book to even talk about sectoral issues or to talk about more micro issues or individual level issues but i've done that in my book because when we are trying to make sense of the macro economy we also need to be going back sometimes to individual units sometimes to sectoral units and trying to make that connection sometimes and even pedagogically and even for understanding a, a topic i think that it becomes helpful so in short uh, my response is the why economics sometimes makes us fragment our study of economics and i think that this is detrimental to what is it that we actually want to do whether it's journalism whether it's policy making whether it's to engage in politics because the because of the structural interconnectedness that exists uh, within the economy okay uh, so uh, so initially when we started talking about the, in the, in this podcast we talked about how currently most of the books are let's say written in the west and it's okay right we're not blaming them they're writing for their own audience they're coming up with their own ideas and way of understanding their economies but you on the other hand talk about like how we should one should view the economy as an embedded system right wherein your history of the country culture the political power sharing arrangement caste panchayat gender etc does play a role and therefore you say that econo- economic outcomes are strongly mediated by social and community norms like could you give an example of this let's say we should talk let's say let's say we talk about something as simple as labor mobility right because a lot of western societies will assume that labor mobility does happen while that may not be the case in india yeah actually uh, thanks abhinav for highlighting this point because uh, i mean i think that people after the ecological kind of uh, revolution and people's recognition we have i mean or many of us have come to take ecological concerns into uh, into uh, how we understand economic issues i think the social concerns are still i mean it is an ongoing process and there have been some attempts at it so for instance now in certain universities people uh, even in azim prem university we have a course on feminist economics there are discussions whether we should have a course on stratification economics or the economics of caste or the economics of gender and several universities are slowly uh, offering courses in these subjects but again as i mentioned before sometimes they become sort of outside the kind of you know core courses and my attempt hmm. in this book is whether we teach microeconomics or macroeconomics in india particularly it is important that we discuss issues relating to caste gender religion these kinds of social factors because they are absolutely central uh, social factors and social ca- i mean social characteristics of the indian economy so now to move on to a kind of example 
And some of these discussions I also have in the later chapter, I think it's chapter seven on uh, employment, where I talk about how gender and caste, are, I mean, uh, how to break down employment when we try to break it down by these two social uh, characteristics. Could you could you elaborate this a little this, this this idea because this topic of employment is really sensitive and in the news and I'm sure the listeners want to understand more about your views on this. Yeah. So what I do in my book is to I mean this is taken from some of the data that is there uh, in the employment unemployment survey and subsequently worked on uh, um, by my colleagues at the Center for Sustainable Employment and they brought out this report called the State of Working India. So what this kind of a data, and this is on page 149, actually show is, depending on your caste, the kind of employment that you get into is very tied to it. So for instance, uh, SC and ST groups are overrepresented in poorly paid occupations. And what you see is that upper castes are overrepresented in well-paid ones. Right? So there is some kind of a selection happening there. And it, it is somewhat similar to uh, the question of uh, women as well. But now moving back to the first question that you asked, if we are, I mean, the question of wages, I want to go to the question of what determines wages in an economy. Again, if we ask students who have studied mainstream economics and have gone through a mainstream education, uh, most of them are going to tell us that wages are determined by demand and supply of labor. And if you again probe a little bit uh, further, uh, the answer will be that it is wages, real wages are determined by the marginal product of labor. And this is, we are assuming it's a perfectly competitive economy and equilibrium situation. So again, the idea of marginal product of labor becomes important. And within this school of thought, your productivity or what you contribute to production is what you get as wages. In the political economy tradition, the argument is that real wages are not determined through market forces, but it is determined largely as a product of history and culture. So what the political economy tradition suggests is that even if you have, I mean, some kind, even if you think of a competitive economy, still the kind of determinants of wages in a patriarchal society would be such that men are paid more than women. And this is coming out of particular cultural arrangements that we have in society. So on one hand, in the mainstream marginalist tradition, wages are seen to be determined by demand and supply. Whereas in the other political economy tradition, there is a recognition of historical and cultural factors. And what I've done in my book is because there is this recognition in the political economy tradition of historical and cultural factors, it has been easy for me to introduce uh, the issues of caste and gender that we have in Indian economy within this kind of a framework. Now, I want to just add one more point to this discussion. One can wonder, you know, one can ask the question, why does it matter? You know, you have two theories, okay, fine. But the implication is this, that if I'm only exposed to marginalist economics, and I believe that wages are determined by the marginal product of labor, then my policy uh, policy suggestion could be that one, we need to have perfect competition. We need to have more competition in the economy. And it also legitimizes, it also justifies when there is a low demand for labor or an excess supply of labor, that it is okay for wages to fall. Now, this is a very kind of problematic thing because yeah, what is our concern? Our concern in a way should be the well-being of people and if so wages should be you know what we are interested in but just to ensure some kind of economic equilibrium how can we justify the lowering of wages below a certain level whereas in the political economy tradition it is understood that wages have to include let's say uh, some aspect of uh, education for their children some kind of food clothing etc etc so there is an understanding that this is determined through certain customs in the economy and it certainly cannot legitimize the lowering of wages below this kind of a customary limit, at least theoretically. Now, politically, what happens is a separate matter. But I think that when we are engaging with these kinds of theories, what it tells us is whether 
a particular theory legitimizes certain kind of uh, market forces or government action and we need to be critical of some of them okay. um so at least in the state that you come from kerala we see that the government is cognizant of social friction right in terms of wages like the people in kerala are better paid than other people in the sense that the government does realize that um, there are social frictions there are certain floors that have to be maintained so that's there so there's another question that i want to ask right because i keep looking at all sort of uh, like regulatory outcomes that come into india like so how cognizant do you think are regulators of the problem that there is associated with political economy and is there a role that the dominant ideas in the sense that the marginalist ideas also play in policy making and how are these things balanced out yeah okay so i think this is a very important question and i don't think that i have a you know full or a complete answer or a good answer for it but uh, i mean th- what i'm going to say is probably some thoughts on the question itself hmm uh because very often most of the policy makers again are exposed to only i mean largely exposed to only mainstream uh, ideas and thoughts on economics so one of the implications certainly would be that if we take a microeconomics textbook which is dominant again uh we there is a chap this discussion on labor market uh, there's a demand and supply of labor and there it's very clearly taught to the students that if we include in, uh, put a minimum wage which is above the equilibrium wage it leads to unemployment so the theory is set up in a particular way to argue that any kind of government intervention into the labor market is bad for the workers mm-hmm. now if one believes in this view of minimum wages then it is likely that people will think and it's not because of their Uh, you know because they have a wrong intention in mind because they've been taught this they might think that minimum wages is a bad thing but whereas on the other hand uh, i think that if they are exposed to the political economy tradition uh, there are no two ways about it it is very clear that these are histo- i mean historically determined and it is absolutely necessary that people have recourse to uh, certain necessities and conveniences in life for instance i would think that today the minimum wage needs to include the cost of internet because internet ought to be seen as a basic necessity because for many things we need the internet so if we are talking about the poverty line if we are talking about minimum wages how do we bring in you know what is necessary for a dignified living and so in that sense it certainly has to be cultural and historical hmm. and it cannot be simply biological where we look at only calories it certainly has to have a larger kind of thing now because you mentioned the kerala um, um, the state of kerala in this context in my book i also mention it while it's true that on an average the wages um, the minimum wages uh, that are given in kerala are higher than other states even within the state of kerala because of the operation of patriarchy you notice that the wages for men are uh, there is a disparity between uh, wages between men and women and which is something that i note in the book so i think there has to be various ways in which different social issues are brought to the table so that policy makers can you know have a better understanding of what can be done and are not fully convinced by the mainstream theory and therefore do not or see certain kind of policy options as being inefficient or undesirable okay and i i think your uh, book does play a role in this regard in the sense that it exposes exposes anyone who wants to read about macroeconomics that there could be certain other outcomes there could be certain other ways of looking at things like obviously the book is very neat and tidy and in a very readable format so it's obviously not complete in itself uh, complete in the sense that yeah uh, <laughs> it touches on everything but obviously you can't cover everything in a 200 250 page odd book but at least it guides the person correctly if he wants to pursue understanding things in this direction uh, so alex uh, now we've talked about like interest rates we've talked about wages etc now i want to bring you back to another very interesting topic that most people are always interested in which is money right and um, you have a very interesting take on money and before you and like i want to also tell the readers about the approach that alex follows in the book so in let's say in this chapter for, for about money he says that there is a financial architecture in india because we've 
most people don't know this financial architecture and the depth of this then he explains the financial architecture and once he know he's explained the architecture then they answer the, then he answers the money question within that article within that architecture so alex could you give a brief about like why you thought of this and what is the architecture in general because so that our readers or listeners can get an idea about how you've constructed chapters in the book yeah uh, so uh, the, i mean my re, uh, one of the things maybe i should start by this is that uh, traditional macroeconomics books uh, start with goods and commodity market and then talk of the money market Uh, but what i've tried to do in my book is to invert uh, that kind of uh, kind of a reasoning because again that kind of a structure of the mainstream book allows have allowed people to say that there's something called the real economy which is the goods and the commodity market there's something called the monetary economy and uh, people like friedman or people um, who follow the monetarist tradition and they've come in various forms then have argued that the monetary sector does not really do anything to the real sector so money is simply a veil money does not alter anything fundamental uh, in the economy so there is this idea that or what is said in the literature money is neutral in the long run uh, so th- that's one kind of dominant view of how people have spoken about it and let me connect this back to the idea of natural rate of interest because the idea of rate of interest is seen to be determined again within the well uh, real or the fundamental sphere and what is the role of monetary policy is not to tinker with that natural rate of interest but try to set interest rates in tandem or in line with this natural rate of interest so even the role of monetary policy is tied to what happens in the uh, the real sector so to speak but i wanted to challenge this kind of a perspective and this comes from again this is uh, uh, i mean i'm writing in the tradition of many people who have worked in this line of thinking uh, including political economists like marx or subsequently keynes kelletsky more recently in the indian context people like krishna bharadwaj who have engaged with these ideas uh, piero straffa who is critical of the mainstream economics so there are many people who have contributed to this tradition and i'm drawing on many of their work but it is to challenge this idea of separating neatly uh, and to argue that money is neutral instead i have taken a position that is very proximate to the work of keynes and also to the work of marx but here i use the phrase from keynes's uh, writing which is called a monetary production economy so i think that whether we are interested in the stock market or whether i am interested in employment or inflation i think that it's important for all of us to view the macro economy or the economy as a monetary production economy where we need to understand the monetary institutions we need to understand the production conditions and that's the approach that i've really followed and i've started off by talking about um, the monetary aspects and very often again when we are taught macro economics sometimes we are taught the financial architecture but we are, we don't really go much in depth uh, and for instance there's not so much discussion on let's say informal finance what happens to money lenders or what does the lic do what does the rbi do uh, who regulates the insurance market and most people in the stock market have an idea of uh, sebi and rbi but there are also other regulators in the system other players in the market how thick are these markets for instance what is the percentage of indians who actually invest in the stock market which is a very 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 minuscule amount also we know that the percentage of indians who pay the income tax or who are eligible to pay the income tax is also a very 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 small amount number because we have a large informal sector so part of the attempt in this book was we want to understand what happens uh, in let's say largely the formal sector by talking about these regulators but for a full understanding and a correct understanding of the indian economy it is important that we also engage with what happens in the informal sector and even the terms formal and informal i think needs to be challenged is there a better way of trying to characterize them okay that's a very interesting take on this uh, uh now i'm going to bring you back to the topic of money so on page 54 of your book uh, you talk about this concept of money in the sense that there is endogenous approach to money and then there is an exogenous approach 
so most books still now have ignored the endogenous approach but then you also talk about a bank of england paper that was published in 2014 which explains what this approach is and it also endorses this approach so for the interest of our listeners if you could tell the difference between these two approaches that would be great yeah so i'll start off maybe with a little bit of yeah i mean just, i mean i'll i shall this time i shall certainly answer all the questions that you pose but i want to start off with a little bit of history here because Uh, up until certainly the global financial crisis i think almost all textbooks except for some textbooks in the alternative heterodox traditions mm. uh, communicated the idea that what we are doing is exogenous money uh, and this is also related to the quantity theory of money idea which suggests that the central bank's role is to target the quantity of money in circulation and it is in that that context uh, to formalize and to account for the quantity of money that uh, in across the world we have monetary aggregates m1 m2 m3 and they were then used uh, in, as inputs into let's say inflation policy how to understand interest rates various kinds of econometric exercises have been carried out within this larger domain of exogenous money but when the financial crisis happened and subsequently many students across the world uh, many teachers expressed their dissatisfaction in mainstream macroeconomics because a mainstream macroeconomics textbook does not have any discussion on crisis even if there is a discussion on at least up until the financial crisis mm. now even if there is a discussion on crisis it is often seen as a one off thing it's seen as an aberration whereas if you actually read the work of keynes or marx most of them or people who are working in the heterodox tradition have a full understanding of the fact that a capitalist society is prone to recurrent crises and it is only if we have an understanding of what are the potential problems with our society and economy that we can formulate adequate responses adequate policies so if we have a theory that if we have in the mainstream paradigm we don't discuss uh, crisis at all then we'll be totally blind sided when something like that happens so and there was that kind of a demand and when i say endogenous money this draws on the work of people like marx people like um, keynes uh, partly i haven't really engaged with it in this work but people like minsky uh, who have contributed to this I, how we understand money and the fundamental difference is this in the exogenous money view people believe that the central bank controls the quantity of money hmm. in the endogenous money view people believe that the central banks can only control the rate of interest and the quantity of money is endogenously created within the uh, money market or the economy so what is the dif- the difference is that in this view the their quantity of money cannot really be determined by the central bank because it varies if there is a greater demand for money in the economy uh, money is created through credits and other kind of uh, uh, other kind of players in the financial market so there is no kind of constraint on that whereas in the exogenous money view it is also tied to the idea of rate of interest as being determined in the market so the natural rate of interest idea or the rate of interest as a time preference is sort of aligned with this idea of exogenous money whereas if you take the question of endogenous money the rate of interest is set by the central bank although there can be multiple theories of the central uh, the rate of interest the one that i favor uh, is that the rate of interest is a conventional variable which a historical variable which is set by people who are in power to make to meet certain kind of uh, policy decisions it could be relating to the exchange rate it could be relating to investment it could be relating to inflation there are multiple policy agendas and you set the rate of interest based on that it has got nothing to do with something called the natural rate of interest is got nothing to do with the rate of time preference okay 
Um, so thank you for touching upon this topic. Now, Alex, I think we've broadly covered uh, what's there in the book, and I think listeners now have an understanding of how yours is an alternate and a desi way of understanding microeconomics. Now, this one question that's been bothering me is that uh, so your book came out, and after that, there's been a lot of discussion independently around the world on the modern monetary theory. right and the book obviously couldn't touch upon that topic because that topic wasn't in vogue at that point of time so my question to you now is uh, like what is your first of all like for our listeners as well what is your understanding of the modern monetary theory and has it has it had an influence on you has it changed the way you think and if you were to rewrite this book or come up with a new edition would this find some space in the book Uh, yeah, thanks for that question, Abhinav. No, I am no expert on mon- uh, modern monetary theory, but uh, from my reading of it, uh, the sense that I get is that there are many parts of modern monetary theory which align with the kind of alternative view that I've put forth in mm-hmm. my book. Uh, for one, uh, there is certainly, I mean, it's closer to the idea of endogenous money, and modern monetary theory explicitly rejects uh, mainstream views on public debt. and here i think i want to talk a little bit about the idea of crowding in and crowding mm. out because under the exogenous money kind of framework uh, the assumption is that if the governments are borrowing uh, it leads uh, it generates or it puts pressure on the interest rate and the interest rates go up uh, and then it means that it crowds out private investment in the economy because the, the rate of cost of borrowing has increased now this kind of a view is based on one the assumption of full employment and two based on the idea of how interest rates are determined right based on the exogenous idea in the indian context we have unemployment we have underemployment so we are nowhere close to the situation of full employment that is one empirical feature but even leaving aside the empirical feature if we go with the endogenous money approach there is no reason to believe that when that when the government intervenes in the economy by building schools or hospitals or other socially necessary infrastructure it will generate uh, an increase in rate of interest which will push out uh, private players and i think here th- there is a very important thing i feel sometimes economists also don't pay attention to is the rate of interest is a policy variable Uh, the markets are also designed by us so we want to design markets we want to design monetary policy we want to design fiscal policy in line with what the society wants so i think the well being of people in the society should be central and the reason we teach equilibrium we have these notions is to ensure this is met very often it happens that uh, we seem to want reality to behave like what our theory says and not try to you know challenge uh, i mean even our understandings of uh, demand and supply equilibrium now uh, having um, having you know sort of uh, said that i also want to make the point here about modern monetary theory on the question of public debt which is tied to this idea of crowding in and crowding out a little bit that they believe that if uh, an economy can create issue sovereign currency at will uh, then there is no issue of unemployment that is the governments can print currency and then uh, use that to employ people that is one view so the view that i've taken in my book is somewhat similar to it because it's somewhat associated to the notion of crowding in however uh, the question of public debt sustainability is something that i do bring up because it is not enough for the government to create money and invest it also has to produce goods and services either that are beneficial for the economy today mm-hmm. or in the future like education or health where the gestation period is long so i think the government expenditure has to be meaningful and that is something that i highlight and the question of what is meaningful also depends on the community so i don't think um, i mean a modern monetary theory i don't think gets into some of these kinds of specifics but yeah. uh, i think that many of the things that modern monetary theory says is aligned to many of the policy proposals in my book but having said that i would not call modern monetary theory a full kind of alternative theory because it has some understanding of public debt 
it has some understanding of currency of money of sectoral balances of inflation but for instance it does not have a theory of price it does not have a theory of income distribution so what it means is that although modern monetary theory is an alternative kind of approach it might have to draw upon certain political economy traditions uh, and align itself with one of these or may, some many of these uh, kinds of theories of price or theories of wages and it can do that easily but i want to mention another point i think that some of the mainstream views on modern monetary theory has come largely from the developed or you know uh, those economies uh, and sometimes they view inflation as still understanding it as a kind of you know too much of money chasing too few goods which is very, yeah classic kind of quantity theory of money kind of thing. although i am aware i think that even within modern monetary theory school there are differences or interpretation mm-hmm. the kind of approach that i have taken in my book for inflation is to is that we need to understand the cause of inflation so for instance if it is brought about by agricultural prices increasing because of lack of storage facilities uh, and that shows up in your consumer price index uh, changing the quantity of money or changing the interest rate might not have any impact on this kind of an issue and traditionally the belief is that inflation has to be done by monetary policy inflation management is monetary policy uh, employment is fiscal policy but if once we look at the issue or what determines inflation in this context in this example that i give and this is the indian case for many uh, most of the time then it's possible to think of a meaningful fiscal policy which creates uh, infrastructure that is go downs or storage facilities and in the process it creates employment and it can also reduce agricultural prices so it is i mean my engagement with political economy has allowed me to see you know different kind of solutions rather than seeing fiscal and monetary policy separately or to even think of a trade off between the philips curve trade off between inflation and unemployment and this kind of a view then enables us to work i think in a more coherent fashion first identifying what is the cause and then to see what kind of policy measures can be done and not blindly see mainstream economic thought as you know some kind of eternal truth okay uh, so thank you alex for answering our question so patiently and thank you for taking time out to do this um like i wish we at zeroda wish you all the best and the success with your books and um, thank you really for doing this thank you so much abhinav thank you All opinions expressed in this podcast are solely of the guest. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only.